Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am once again joined today by Max Popienko, whose name I'm hopefully pronouncing better now. Yeah, it's almost right. <laughs> I'm getting close. Yeah. Uh, and today we figured we'd talk about uh, Soviet handguns and Soviet handgun ammunition, because there's yes. a lot of a lot of the newer stuff just hasn't made its way into the United States, and I think there are a lot of issues with, for example, the choice of the 9mm Makarov cartridge that a lot of Americans and Europeans probably aren't very familiar with. Okay, the story of actual Soviet handgun ammunition starts in the late 20s. So I mean, it was already obvious that Nagantro, or Nagantro there, is obsolete. So very little practical military use. So it's only good for suicide, something like this. So, about 1927-1928, Red Army expert decided, so, okay, we need a new semi-automatic pistol, and we need a new submachine gun. Two classes of weapons. The submachine gun at the time was seen as sort of a personal defense weapon for non-commissioned officers, like sergeants, for frontline lo lower rank officers, so it was not like a mass-issued weapon. PDW, personal defense weapon. So uh, obviously they needed a sing single round for both semi-automatic pistol and for submachine gun. And they had two choices, actually. One is best known as uh, 7.63 Mauser. There was a lot of this ammunition in Russia because a lot of uh, Mauser pistols, broke handle Mauser pistols were ball. In 20th from German, ball of Mausers were popular, Powerful, more or less accurate. But there was second very serious choice as 9mm Parabellum. Actually, there was two fractions inside the top brass. One preferred 9mm Parabellum because it was seen as a more effective and better stopping power because of bigger caliber. The second preferred uh, Mauser, 7.63 Mauser ammunition, because it was almost the same caliber as the Nagant and Mosin rifle. So you can use same machinery for made barrels, and actually, in case of emergency, you can use discarded or rejected rifle barrels, cut them with several pieces and produce pistol barrels from a good pieces of the barrel. So in the end, with 7.62 millimeter crowd one, they decide, okay, we go for the with a 7.62 cartridge, this is it, probably everybody knows, it's almost the same as, seven, as Mauser cartridge, with very small differences in primer size and extraction group. So original ammunition was the lead core, very common, and it was so through the, all the great patriotic war, World War II. However, it was few special versions, a tracer and an armor piercing with steel core. But it was rare, it was not really widely issued. So uh, most pistols and most submachine guns were used with this round with lead core. After the war, the Soviet army switched to a new small arms system, which basically had no place for a submachine gun. So uh, adopted in 19. 49, the primary rifle of the Soviet infantry was Simonov SKS carbine. Semi automatic, lightweight, 10 round magazine, moderate recall, pretty good military rifle for the time. The <laughs> submachine gun was replaced by Kalashnikov. Tamat Kalashnikov, it was at the time a limited issue item for special troops, for NCOs, and so on. It was the direct replacement for the submachine gun. Well, it was squad automatic weapon, the RPD, Dictorio. So there was no place for submachine gun. So when the armies post-war selected handgun ammunition, especially NATO armies, they had to consider that it was still for them a primary a submachine gun ammunition. To be honest, in military use, pistol of very little importance. Right. According to a few authors, more friendly, more personal killed by handguns and more enemy, by accident, suicide, or something like this. So submachine gun is much more important you know, military issue. So 
you have to optimize your handgun armor for a submachine gun. Uh, you need uh, at least 100 and preferably 200 meters range. You need some penetration and so on for mass issued weapon. With handgun, you don't need any range say, beyond 20 meters maximum because you cannot expect to hit anything in stress at 20 meters. It's even very optimistic. Right. So you don't need all this power you have in a typical 7.6 or in 9 millimeter look for a pistol, especially if there's no body armor, it's just standard cloth. So uh, after the war, Soviet designers, Soviet experts concentrated on strictly handgun ammunition. So they wanted a compact, lightweight pistol, which will not be burdensome for officers. So it's very, very short range weapon. So it had to be better stopping power power than 7.62 top rifle ammunition, but only at short range. They don't want all, all the range, like 200 or 300 meters. So we did some calculation and testing. They said, okay, nine millimeters is the best optimum. So it's sufficient for a good rounding channel. So it's enough stopping power, but you don't need a lot of power to shoot a bullet all the way like submachine gun. So you can actually make a shorter or lighter round, which results in a shorter, lighter pistol with simpler design, simple blowback. So this hell yeah, it's nine millimeter Makara was born. It is, so it's also well known. So original Makarov was also with lead core. It was very typical, so very close to the nine millimeter ultra German round with a different caliber. So it's actually bullet diameter is a 9.2 millimeter because it's a Russian tradition. So all calibers are nominal. Like you don't expect to bullet to be same diameter as a nominal caliber, say like 38 uh, special in the United States and a lot of other examples. So Soviets normally measure caliber by the grooves. Okay. No, no, no by the lens of a rifle. So a smaller diameter. So bullet projectile is normally wider than a nominal caliber. So it's like 7.62 uh, bullet is almost 8 millimeter in diameter. So this was the same case. Okay. Uh, in mid 50s, it was decided that lead is expensive, it's strategic material. So let's save, let's do a little bit saving. So they replaced a part of the lead inside with a simple stamped uh, steel core. It's mild steel. It helped penetration a little, especially against like, uh, steel helmets, but not much. But primary it was to save lead to make the round less expensive. However, as soon as uh, 1963, uh, Soviet designers decided that maybe there is a space to improve penetration, just to make against some obstacles and just in case. So we did a little bit of testing with a 9mm Makara Fama, but the result was you need more energy. Even if you mm. add a hard core, you need more energy, you need more velocity. There's no replacement for velocity. And this results in more recoil. And Makarov pistol is not well designed to contain a more recoil because it becomes very unpleasant to shoot and it swears very quickly. So it was postponed for a while until the Soviet Olympic, Moscow Olympics of 1980. So it was a very huge political international meeting event and Soviet government didn't want anything bad to happen. So KGB was preparing for several years for this event because there were chances of some domestic terrorism or international terrorism, some criminal activities against international guests. So they took pains to cover all bases. One of those bases was to make a better penetration cartridge against the contemporary body armor or soft body armor or body armor with a thin aluminum plate. Mostly it was a flag jacket mm -hmm. them if, if against fragments or soft uh, core projectiles. But KGB wanted something so we can shoot against the contemporary light body armor from pistols. They didn't care about longevity of pistols. 
Okay, they can use it for one mission and then throw away this kind of situation. So we didn't care for increased recoil because, okay, they're highly trained and professional. And if it comes to shooting up actual criminal, be damned if someone breaks the arm or just get his arm cut. So, it's just. so in the end, in about uh, 1978, 1979, we designed this kind of Makarov cartridge. It's hmm. called RG. 0.28 RG028. It looks exactly like it looks like a hollow point Makar. However, right. a cavity is filled by the hardened steel plug. And the hole is made so the core doesn't have to waste energy on penetrating the jacket. Hmm. So it just goes upon impact, it just goes straight out of the jacket, jet jacket stays on the Say armor plate and steel core goes right, right, uh, right in. It was quite effective for this round. However, since it was KGB development, it was requested, it was secret. So military was not aware of this development. And they had a better mean. If okay, they have an enemy with flag jackets, they probably have a Kalashnikov or Simonov or something else. So they it was not a primary concern for right. a pistol. And since, you know, while I was speaking on the Makar, there was actually a hollow point. You see, it looks different. It's a black tip. This also a KGB development, also for Olympics, but this is entirely different. It's an actual low penetration cartridge. Hmm. With soft core, it was designed to be used against aircraft hijackers. So it's a low velocity, the soft plastic core inside the jacket. So it's actually a very short range round for a special work. It's called SP-8. So it's an hour round from 70s is this little guy. It's 5.45, it's 18 millimeters. It's called MPC, Mal Caliber Patron Central Boy, Small Bore Center Fire Pistol Round. So this is for PSM pistol. It's very interesting development. So in late uh, 60s, both KGB and the general staff of the Russia, uh, Soviet Army requested development of deep consultant pistol for two different purposes. One was for the Plain clothes KGB again, agents operating in country. So we need something easily considered thin and yet effective. Uh, the other also gen by basically general officer's pistol for generals or top brass. So something like a suicide special. So should be not thicker than a matchbox. A typical matchbox, which was at the time at about 17 or 18 millimeters thick. So you had to put, since it was written into requirements, you had to fit a barrel inside this, barrel inside the slide. So the practical limit for a bore was like a 22 caliber. But 22 low rifles was too low power for this. And for some reason, we thought that uh, 25 ACP, like 6.35, was not good too. So it had insufficient penetration. So Soviet designer went out and decided to entirely a new round, this one. It has a pointed bullet with mild steel core. But basically the same. So mild steel, you need to save a lead, so make it cheaper to produce. It can go through the soft Kevlar, but it was not really uh, actual intent. So they, uh, there is a lot of uh, real life events when a police or KGB used PSM pistols against criminals, inflicted lethal wrong, uh, wounds, but the criminal actually died minutes after being shot. So, so there no, was a case when a, a Criminal was shot in the chest with this pistol and keep screaming, stop shooting me with blank pistol. So keep assaulting the officer. And then after 
about 10 minutes, simply collapsed and died from internal bleeding. So he didn't believe he was actually shot. So it was too small. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that you need a second shot just to shoot himself. It's a case of suicide attempt. But still, this little guy had a lot of mystic around it. So it was even an attempt to produce a machine pistols firing with this. But it was not effective at all because the designers told the law enforcement, OK, guys, here's machine pistols. I can shoot three rounds in a fraction of a second. We don't need it because we need probably all in a full magazine to stop a bad guy. <laughs> and we better stuff in something bigger, like a nine millimeter. And that's nine millimeters where I get back to the military pistol story. So. In uh, 1991, so exactly at the same moment as Soviet Union collapsed, the Soviet went suddenly the Russian army decided that it needed a new pistol because the body armor was prol proliferating. The NATO was issuing body armor, better body armor on bigger scale. So they decided, okay, so we need something a little bit better than all Makarov pistol. In 19 91, we started a uh, research and development program called the name Grach, Ruk. So it was a code name. So there's no reason to uh, seek the some, of, some reason in the, those names. It's just a code name. So the original intent was to produce a pistol which can penetrate typical body armor about 25 meters. So this required steel core, hardened steel core. Retail and powerful cartridge. The first one actually developed by Snit Ashmash was a special case with semi-jacketed bullet like this. It was a slightly different shape, but basically it was a father of this cartridge. It has a case 21 millimeter long, hardened steel penetrator with slightly pointed nose. And the lead uh, wrapping around the uh, steel core and inside the. When the military decided, okay, so this new round, but we we'll still have a stock of so all ammunition, so let's make, let's request a modular pistol, which with the swap of a barrel magazine can shoot three rounds. New round, a nine millimeter Makarov, and uh, old 7.62 Tokarev. So we played a little bit with this idea, and then say, okay, so it's new when Soviet Union is down, we know, we're building capitalism, so we need a, we want a pistol which uh, can be sold for export. It's hard to believe that we can sold a lot for export for pistol which fires proprietary or old obsolete ammunition. So what will sell better? So nine millimeter Luger. So let's make the old nine millimeter case with a new, uh, new armor piercing bullet. And about 1993-95, they designed this round, which is known as 7N21. It's same semi-jacketed armor piercing cartridge, but in nine millimeter parabellum case. The issue is it's rather hot loaded. So pressure wise, it's about same as American plus P plus ammunition. So it can be fired from the Glock or from some stronger NATO standard pistols, but from a local experience, uh, lifespan of the Pistols designed for standard NATO ammunition shortens significantly. By several barrel wear due to steel jacket and due to hard nose, it tends to wear uh, feed ramps, to scratch feed ramps, especially if it's aluminum frame, plastic frame, uh, feed, uh, damaged plastic. So you need a pistol specially designed for this. That's one reason why a, a European pistol was made from steel. It had to life with a very powerful, very hot ammunition with hard nose. So to be more specific about performance, so I have 
you only converted it to American measures. So uh, 7N21 cartridge is bullet weight is 5.3 gram or 82 grains. Hmm. And muzzle velocity is uh, 460 meters per second, all 1500 feet per second. Wow. Uh, it's hot. That's hot. Uh, from pistol barrel. Yeah. From five inch pistol barrel. That's hot. That's not, not the hottest outfit. So this uh, became the primary uh, military pistol ammunition in Russia. So most widespread. It also can be used in submachine guns. However, this ammunition had some issues with production. So later on, uh, another type of armor piercing or improved uh, penetration ammunition was designed. It's called 7N30. See, it's very interesting nose shape. It's mostly steel core with short jacket, like a cup, which only covers rear of the core. The front part of the core completely ex uh, exposed. It's hardened steel, tool grade steel. It's also hood. So it's a little bit heavier, it's seven gram or 108 grains. And it clocks out from a pistol at about 430 meters per second or 1400 feet per second. It's best work from a submachine gun. I shoot it from a Vita submachine gun. It really does a trick on the car bodies or car windshields or the body armor, it's even with a plate or steel plate. So it's really something. It's much better than standard ball. The uh, problem is, again, it's steel cord and it's a plus plus plus, so you try to shoot it from a Glock or from MP5, uh, you get uh, significant wear on barrel on the internal parts. And last, the fastest Russian pistol round is this one. It's 7N31. It was specifically developed by KG uh, KBP, uh, develop, uh, Equipment Design Bureau from Tula, for the Gesha 18 pistol, for the Soviet Glock, Russian Glock, like it was known. So, it's very lightweight plastic pistol with rotary barrel locking, with Glock like trigger, Glock like in execution. Unfortunately, in real life, uh, trigger is even worse than the Glock, than the stock Glock. It's more like a probably New York trigger Glock. <laughs> But pistol is extremely strong, it can be said, Ex with extremely strong multi-lock lock up. So we made a, a very hot, something like plus P, plus, 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 something around. So it's bullet weights only 4 and 4.2 gram, it's like a 64, 65 grains, but it clocks out at 600 meters per second, all about, uh, 1960 feet per second. It's wow. almost 2000 feet per second from a pistol barrel. And short range is really spectacular. It has good penetration. It creates a huge wound channel even without expanding. But it's because it's lightweight, it's only short range. It didn't calc like with law enforcement because the Gisha 18 is limited issue pistol hmm. because the KBP has a limited production capabilities they make most money from a bigger weapon systems and for them it's uh, like side business just like it did because they can so so far the primary rounds in Soviet uh, military and sorry Russian military Russian law enforcement is uh, nine millimeter uh, seven uh, 7N21 and 7N30, used in the Yerigin pistol. The Makarov is still present. Okay. With significant numbers, mostly with law enforcement, non-infantry units, but it gradually is being replaced. There was a thing like a Makarov modernized, Makarov Magnum. So same case, but loaded with lighter bullet and uh, stronger charge to make a faster 
problem was that, again, recall was too strong for a standard Makarov pistol. It was very unpleasant to shoot. And, and worn out, pistols were worn out in less than a thousand shots. So it was quickly abandoned and uh, withdrawn from the service. So it was only used briefly during late uh, 90s. But there are still the thing I show you. This is a uh, 9x21 millimeter round. The product byproduct of the Grash trials. Army rejected it because it had no export potential, it was a little bigger and too powerful for their liking. But it was uh, picked it up by uh, FSB. Hmm. The former KGB, the FSB, they wanted because for Army, a pistol is often a side armor and gun uh, weapon of last importance for law enforcement especially for fsb for anti-terror unit for organized crime units so pistol is often primary equipment so we need the most of it so we like extra power extra penetration and during uh, late 90s we adopted this round a family of rounds with armor piercing, with a standard ball, the tracer, and with expanding a hollow point. For the way you use with a pistol, the SR1, and a submachine gun, the SR2. So they use it, a pistol and surround were brought, and for some reason, military also decided to adopt it. In about 2003, we actually assigned military designation like uh, 7N28, 7N29 uh, and right now there is actually a competition for what will be a future pistol round for Russian army. So it will be either old, uh, old new 9mm Parabellum or when newer 9mm uh, SP-10, so it's longer and more powerful round. So you probably heard that uh, there are new pistols in the pipeline. So it was a Lebedev PL-15 pistols, which was originally des designed for army. But when the Kalashnikov concern decided that it better to concentrate on law enforcement market and redesign this pistol for 9mm Luger for requirements of the uh, Russian law enforcement, but uh, some fra fractions in military still want uh, more penetration for military pistol. So they're pushing for a military adoption of a new pistol in 9x21. This is where a new pistol, you know, UDAF, comes. It's designed by Sni Tashmash. Uh, it looks very much like a Heckler Koch USP pistol. It's similar, it also has a plastic frame, it has similar shape, it also has double action external hammer trigger. Of course, it has a lot of uh, differences inside, but mostly uh, you want to have an idea how it looks and how it feels. It looks and feels exactly like HT USP 40, it's grip, shape, and so on. So, it's weight, balance of the slide. So it's classic double action pistol with polymer frame, firing very powerful uh, 9x21 uh, ammunition. It's still an advanced trial stage. It's, it's not a clear if army will buy it, buy it as a primary standard issue pistol, or a little bit a limited issue pistol for a say special forces because Snita Shmash also made a special subsonic round with heavy steel core bullet and they made a sound suppressor for this pistol. So yes, it's actually there are several nine millimeter different nine millimeter rounds in service in Russia. It's old nine millimeter Makarov, it's nine millimeter Luger and several laws and nine X twenty one millimeter. It's also it should be noted that it's not the same 9x21 millimeter as used in Europe. Okay. It's it has a longer overall length and it's much more powerful. It has a heavy load. Uh, to be more specific, this uh, armor piercing load uh, 
has a bullet which weighs 6.7 gram, it's 103 uh, grains, with muzzle velocity of uh, 410 meters per second, or around uh, 1350 feet per second. So it's probably somewhere uh, in terms of velocity and power, something close to 357 Zig automatic. But right. only has a its, its primary version with an armor piercing steel core bullet. It still has a this one is a hollow point expanding law enforcement special bullet with a plastic plug to assist feeding. And the pistol is actually used by special SWAT like units like Sobramon, the people who whose primary weapon is either submachine gun or pistol. They, it works very well against car bodies, again, windshields, uh, can sell body armor, steel doors, this kind of obstruction, where you cannot use a Kalashnikov or something, some other long gun. So it's, it's, you know, it's not all Russian ammunition. There's a lot of more specialized rounds, but I think we'll should cover them and separate chat because it's a very different, fascinating story with lots of science, lots of developments. And I think well, that's all for. All right. It was well, thank you very much. That was that was really cool. I did not know most of that. No. It's funny to me, the uh, the issues with the um, the armor piercing nine uh, millimeter parabellum sound to me very much like the issues that the US military had with its M855A1, which had an exposed hardened penetrator. It was higher pressure and it would lead to increased wear and tear on rifles and it would tear up feed ramps for exactly the same reason. Yes. Uh, interestingly, it's a very old concept of creating armor piercing ammunition with exposed hardened nose. I was able to trace it to the Borchardt patents of more than a century ago, hmm. when Soviets resurrected it in its special ammunition for KGB, and when Americans came to this with like uh, new M855A1. So it's all it's all goes, goes around and all ideas are new again. Yep. But the problems, yes, if you do, if you have a uh, pointed, so actually this one is uh, nose, it's not so pointed, so it's here, a flat about two millimeters in diameter, but still can scratch the rear feed ramp, especially if it's aluminum or plastic feed ramp. Right. The American rifle round has much pointer nose, so it's even bigger problem. Yeah, yeah, they designed but a it, new follower for the magazines to, to lift it a little higher. And uh, despite uh, its physical law, laws of physics don't care about geographics and politics, they are same everywhere. Exactly. So if you want better, more penetration, you need more velocity, you need more mass, and that means more recoil, more power. And you just cannot cheat on Newton laws. You can cheat on tax laws, you can cheat probably traffic laws. There is no way you can cheat on Newton laws. Exactly. But unfortunately, it seems that most militaries still think they can do cheat Newton laws. Be requesting something like we need super super powerful gun with low recoil, low weight, probably cheaper and lighter than previous one. It goes for centuries. So <laughs> don't learn. Yep, exactly. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show and for sharing all that. I think that was really interesting to people. Okay, welcome. I hope we'll we'll have a chance to talk more. So maybe discuss uh, some ideas. Maybe get um, more like a discussion, not a monologue from me. Or some uh, like discuss uh, views from the West and from the East on some issues like uh, where pistol ammunition goes, or how it should go, and so on. Maybe uh, we want civilian laws, suppressors, and so on. I look forward at some point to getting in, in touch with you in person so that we can chat.
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really like to, to show you around in Russia. There's a lot of place to see, a lot of interesting guns to report. <laughs> so you're welcome. And people so should remember, we are, still, race is over. we are still working on publishing your book. Um, yeah. It's coming out in Russian first, and then uh, uh, Headstamp is going to be publishing it in English, I believe. Yes, yes. So the plan is I'm going to send my finished Russian manuscript to publisher probably early February. So, and then I will finish the English text. The, uh, both books will have a fantastic amount of color photos. Most of them never seen before, even in Russia. There was a lot of new info for the West, a lot of areas not covered previously, a lot of stuff from reports. So I hope it will be very interesting to read. Of course, I it will be very me. interesting to look through because there was a lot of very interesting and sometimes really weird and really interesting and unusual guns. And uh, still hope to get more photos. Still working on it. So I know everybody likes a lot of photos, especially Americans. So, <laughs> yes, uh, I think uh, the text will be ready within a few months, and then it's up to you guys to make it. I know you can make it as a really worthwhile book. It's going to be fantastic, and I'm very excited for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. thanks for watching, guys. Okay, bye.